There's the morning view from above. I'm trying to stay away from around the other corner because it's just way, way too loud there. I might go there and videotape. I'm not going to show you what the river's like when it's swollen around that corner right now, but it's just too loud. I can't, uh, you'll never hear nothing if I go over there and, and get the, and try to get these emails out shared. But, uh, for all you anglers out there, you imagine the torture I'm putting myself through? <laughs> I've got this river right here behind the house, and I got another one over there. And uh, like I was helping my friend put a roof on his house the other day, and we had to sit there and watch these guys in a drift boat anchored up battling salmon all day. Ugh. And there's a lot of good looking, healthy chrome ones in there, still big springs, and they're catching them one after the other. <laughs> I know there's steelhead in here right now. That's what gets me going. I got enough salmon in the freezer, but I'm a full-on steelhead addict, and this is driving me freaking crazy looking at this right now. Let me zoom in on that run. I don't know if you can see what I'm seeing, but... Yeah, nothing less than delicious looking down there, is it? Why are we not all fishing? <laughs> anyway. So there you go, there's my torture. It's raining this morning, not right now, so let me take advantage of this pause in the rain. See what we got, more people need to be heard. And no, there's no goat with me today. <laughs> um, all right, here's another one. Another follow-up email from another retired cop. Um, I can't remember this uh, directly to you. Uh, I can't remember if you said to use your full name or not. I think you said to leave your name. But I remember it was okay to use your nickname, Cujo. Thanks, Cujo. I remember your email previous for sure. And let's see what you got. Steve, I don't know if you remember me, but I emailed you a few months back and answered some questions you asked of law enforcement. Anyway, this email is to say thank you again, and this is why. I've learned a lot about Sasquatch being since watching HTH, especially about keeping as safe as possible when you may be in their territory. I was able to pass some of this on to my niece on a camping trip she took, and all. And I'll never know for sure, but it may have helped her stay safe. Here's what happened. She's my wife's niece, late 20s, single mom of a boy 10 years and girl 6. She called my wife a few weeks back and was on speaker so I could hear. She had taken her kids tent camping outside of Susanville in a remote area that was not a designated campsite. From what I gathered, this place was off a dirt road about 5 miles in from the nearest paved road up a heavily wooded mountainside. She used to party up there before she had the kids. So she's talking to my wife and said something strange had happened. She went on to say that after she set up her tent and campsite, she took the kids and drove the 10 miles into town to get some supplies. When they returned, she said there was a tree across the dirt road a couple hundred yards from her campsite. She said she had to walk the rest of the way because she couldn't drive around it and there were no other campers in the area at all. When I heard this, I got concerned. A little bit later, my wife handed the phone to me because she had to check on our kids upstairs. My niece knows I'm a believer. She's on the fence. So I told her that the tree may be a message to stay out of that area from a Sasquatch. She laughed. I asked her how big the tree was. She said about the size of a telephone pole. After several more questions about wind, roots, root ball, if it had broken or fallen, if the ground was disturbed by the root ball as it fell, I learned that it appeared as if someone or something had obviously placed it there while she was gone. She was a little concerned, but not enough to leave. More questions. No structures, some bent and broken smaller trees, no smell, and normal forest noises, except for when she first arrived when it was silent, weirdly silent, were her words. I told her, I told her that if she was going to stay, she was armed with a 38, that she may want to just tell them her intentions out loud, that she didn't want to disturb them and hurt them, and just wanted 
wanted time camping with the kids. I also told her the 38 probably wasn't going to do shit to the big guy. And to tell them that she had had it, but it wasn't for them, it wasn't for any humans that would seek to harm her or her kids. She thought it was silly, but I coached her on what to say from what I'd seen on your channel, and she did it while she was on the phone with me. Wife thought I was crazy, but I don't care. She also gifted some fruit on a tree on my suggestion, also thinking this was silly. Ultimately, she and the kids had a good night camping. No problems, no noises, smells, knocking, whooping, rock throwing, nothing. And the fruit was gone in the morning. I'll never know what exactly happened or if my suggestions helped her through the night, but I think it may have, and I learned that stuff, and I learned that stuff from your channel. I hear Susanville is a high activity area for Sasquatch. Is this true? Thanks, Steve Cujo. Dude, I don't know, man. I don't know if it's true or not. I'm not familiar with the zone, and I honestly, I don't stay up on... Uh, I, I don't ever actually myself, I don't ever look into various areas to see if there's any reported Sasquatch sightings there. And the only reason I do that is because I know these things are freaking everywhere and anywhere. And you are not going to be able to predict it. So, things still working? Yeah, it's still working. Uh, you know, what's really cool is that you're not ashamed to just speak out loud and factual about it, give her that advice no matter what, if she's, if she accepts these facts or not. Um, that's what's supposed to happen now, right? I mean, the cat's out of the bag, everybody knows. It's time to speak openly, and that's all there is to it. So, and like I said earlier, I'm trying to encourage people to speak loud about it. Whether you laughed at it or not, at least you've done your part. At least you're not guilty if shit goes down with somebody later on, which turns their life upside down or gives them lifelong PTSD. At least you told them. You gave them the warning. You did your part. You're honest. And then it's up to people to take what they will and leave it, right? Our classic line on this channel. Take what you will or leave it. Anyway, thank God she's all right. Uh, I'll admit when she left the food, it made me cringe a bit. Oh. Um, teach your own. I am not a supporter of leaving gifts and food for these beings myself. That's just me because of my stance on it. I share this. I share all this with them right here, and more. And uh, I share it with grizzly bears. I share it with everything. We all share it together, and we all hope to be left alone and to live our lives individually and do what we do without any harassment. Right. So that's what I want. I don't need to be. Uh, trading things with them. I don't need them to be expecting me to leave something for them and possibly get pissed at me if I miss a day or a week or a weekend. I'm not into it. So you get steer over there, walk by me, I don't give a shit. If I hear you knocking a tree, I don't give a shit. Just let me know you're there. You want me to get out of here? I'm out of here. I'm good. Whatever. There's tons of area for me to go and enjoy what I do and do what I gotta do. But anyway, absolutely appreciate you. appreciate your email, man. Uh, you're giving people courage and showing a great example of what to do, right? And uh, I have a feeling your niece, she's probably uh, looking into these this topic a little more by now, I would imagine, even though she probably won't admit it. Have you seen any fish rise down there yet? I'm sure one more from here and then I'm gonna go down to the river. I could have shot one. Hi, Steve. I've written to you before, and it was a huge relief to finally tell someone that story with no fear of ridicule or the sort of derision I've always gotten in the past. I'm 63 years old, and I've hunted and fished my entire life, and still do to this day. I've always done the same thing you do since my first sighting. I've made it a point when I'm in the woods to just make sure I say out loud and think it all day long while I hunt. I'm here, you know I'm here, and I'd prefer you just left me alone if you would do that for me. I found that it does seem to keep the sightings and the interactions to a minimum. I honestly don't care that only my first counter, first encounter was violent because I truly do not wish to see these things anymore. I can't say they are Sasquatch or anything else for that matter because, in all honesty, I don't know what they are. I do know they will change your perspective in ways you can't even imagine until it happens to you. I've always carried a can of bear spray and a pistol anytime I hunted in areas where a bear could be present. I've hunted all over Montana, Wyoming, Alberta, and North and South Dakota. I've fished much of the Pacific Northwest and Alaska, but mostly charters and some short backcountry packing trips for trout and salmon. Maybe one or two day hikes and then overnight and fish my way out. 
This incident happened in 1977, just north of White Sulphur Springs, Montana, in the mountains above Hauser, Hauser, H A U S E R, Hauser Lake. I was elk hunting in the Avalanche Butte area and had covered most of these mountains in great detail on foot or on horseback many, many times. There are granite intrusions all over that area that seem to have formed in strips across that particular section of the mountain and beneath each intrusion is a nice open bench that extends relatively flat until it hits the next cliff line and drops down about 10 to 40 feet before forming another bench. It was cold that day, mid-teens, well below freezing and the sun was out. Snow was firm and I had snowshoes on so had hiked up from the head of Wagner Gulch Road just before it turned south at the head of the gulch. There was a nice open meadow there, so nice and flat and easy parking without blocking the road. I'd set up camp and left about 5.30 a.m. as we wanted to possibly catch the elk passing from one side of the mountains to the other, which they do on a regular basis in that area. I'd hiked up to one of the cliff lines and had not cut any tracks, so I decided to stop and eat my lunch. I hunkered down below the sight line and from below and in between a big cleft in the rock so I could see the bench below me and had a good left-right field vision to study further down into the valley too if I wanted to get my spotting scope out. I was carrying my 358 Norma Magnum that day with full copper bullets, which at the time were not cheap by any means for that caliber. I had to special order them from Spear to even get them. They are 250 grains and I've never had anything walk away from one of those rounds. No doubt. Including your shoulder. <laughs> I've shot bear, moose, deer, and elk with that gun and those rounds and all were one-shot kills. I've had a two to seven burrow scope mounted on the gun with a 26 inch custom barrel. It looks like a dream. Holds about a nickel sized group of five at 300 yards, no problem. I sighted in for 100 yards dead on and know my rounds and ballistics. So 300 is nothing to be concerned about. I sat down and was eating my lunch. And as I sat, the woods just went that sickening silent you dread to hear after you've seen one of these things. No doubt. I was instantly on high alert looking in all directions and gauging the wind too. I did not see or hear anything for about 10 minutes. Just out of the corner of my eye, caught movement on the edge of the cliff line to my right and when I turned to look I did not see anything at first. I picked up my rifle as where I'd seen the movement was about 75 yards from me. So I threw my rifle scope on the area and decided and started studying every little gap in the rocks all along the edge. I even turned the scope up to 7 power magnification to get all the detail I could without digging my spotting scope out, my, out of my pack. As I scanned the rock face, there it was. This huge head facing the same direction I was just surveying the bench in front of it. I watched as it slowly turned its head from left to right, seemingly looking for something on the bench below. I had my crosshairs on its left temple for a full three minutes. And the entire time I was watching, I was having an internal debate on whether or not I should shoot. I finally decided that, I finally decided that for myself, unless I was being directly threatened by these things, I would not pull the trigger on one as they are simply too human-like and I would feel like a murderer. That is simply my decision for myself and not for debate with anyone. I studied every detail of what of that head for what seemed like an hour, but it was probably closer to 15 minutes. 15 minutes in wildlife time, in outdoor time, as you know, 15 minutes is like six hours to me. Your average, your average wild, wildlife encounter is probably only going to be less than a minute. Seconds, 20 seconds, if it's close. Unless, of course, it's off in the distance, but 15 minutes is forever to observe one of these things in broad daylight. As soon as I put my rifle down, Okay, hold on. Then lowered my gun and just watched. As soon as I put my rifle down, it turned its head, looked me straight in the eyes, nodded, and vanished below the cliff edge. I sat there till the squirrel started chattering again and walked over to where I'd seen it. There was a rock outcropping about five feet down from the top of the cliff, and in the snow on top of that rock were the perfect imprints of this thing's bum. It actually made me laugh. It was just comical because if I had found that spot first, that is where I would have sat too. I hiked around the end of the cliff and back to the rock and from the top of that rock, if I stood on it, had to raise my hand about a foot above my head to get my hand to the level its chin would have been. I'm 5'11", weigh about 200 pounds. 
but the snow was so stiff I was barely making a mark with my snowshoes. It sank into the snow for a good 8 or 10 inches, and even taking my snowshoes off and jumping up and down on the snow, I could only go about 3 inches in comparison. I could have pulled the trigger at least 100 times in the time I had those crosshairs on it, but just could not bring myself to do it. I had no intention of eating that thing, and as I said, they are just too human-like for me to ever shoot one other than in self-defense. I have three more encounters to share with you, but that can be for another time. My name is John Bowen, and you are more than welcome to share my name. It's such a relief to finally be able to tell someone about this and not have any worries about being ridiculed about what I think I saw. I don't know what they are, but I do know if they wanted to do us harm, nothing or nobody's going to stop them. The strength, speed, and agility of these things is out of our understanding of what any animal is capable of. Just saying. Thank you for allowing us to have a safe haven where we can share openly what we know. Appreciate you so very much. Thank you for all you do. Good hunting, my friend, John. John, thanks for that email, man. I'm sure uh, I'm relieved to read that you didn't pull that trigger. I'm pretty certain there's going to be some other uh, handful of other people going to be, I can't believe you didn't just shoot that thing and prove it once and for all. Like I said before, I'll say it until I'm freaking purple in the face. Um, these witnesses is the proof. The proof's in. <laughs> if, you, if you have it in, if it's in between your ears to discredit tens of thousands of fellow human beings that aren't connected in any way, you're basically a loser. You're losing. You've, you're, you're losing. You've, whoosh, you've missed a big, big piece of life that is... Uh, that is supposed to include all of us together as friends, neighbors, community, you've missed it. You're a loser, you're losing. Snap out of it. Uh, somebody said to me the other day, said it's just stories, they're all stories you know. It's just stories, it's no proof. And I don't need to convince anybody. I just left it at that. That mind and my mind have nothing in common. All I'd be able to do is say something sarcastic, start some kind of a headbutt back and forth and it'd just be a waste of time and energy and I'm like, mm, whatever. It's not for everyone. That's what I always say to everybody who, who shakes your head at it. I just say, hey, it's not for everyone, man. It's just the topic's not for everyone. But for those who have seen, it's definitely for them. So uh, the proof's in. And if you, if you turn the tables, let's just say you were hunting alone, looking over that bluff, and two of these things are behind you and you don't know it, and they see you. And they realize, as, they, as you know they could, man, I could kill that guy in two seconds. I think I'm going to do it just because. And then they wipe your ass off the face of this planet. Just like that. You didn't even know they were there. You didn't do anything to them. You're done. Your family's just lost you forever. You're done. You're gone. You're done. Why? And your family's going to be pissed. Why the hell did they kill John? Why? Why did they kill my dad? Why did they kill my brother? I don't get it. He just... He was just out hiking and they killed him. They came across him and killed him for nothing, right? So uh, I'm a firm believer if you've seen one of these things and you pop one just because, uh, that's a huge gamble, man, because I think that you will be targeted. Nothing good will come from that. You'll potentially trash your life. Guaranteed you'll never be able, to go, be able to go in the woods again. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of going anywhere near the woods if I shot one of those things for the hell of it. But, like I said before, it comes to self-defense, game on, man. We're playing for keeps and as fast and accurate as I can. Some, some, anything threatens me in the woods, threatens my life or family, friends, whatever, partners. I'm, I'm going to do everything I can to dispatch that threat as fast as I can. As everybody should, right? It's no big deal. It's not a macho thing to say. It's just common sense. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to take you down. I'm going to show you the other side of the river. Then I'm going to go around and, and go down back below that usual spot. And I'll get a couple more emails out. And then it is major barn day. I'm actually building the barn doors today. And then uh, maybe we'll get another share done in the shop. And then uh, I'm out of here to go help some people elk hunt. Let's go see what's down there.
That's where I sat on that rock down there and made a video and that bear come up behind me down the river. So obviously there's a pile more water in here since then, right? Let's keep going. Take you to the other spot. I videotaped that bear swimming. That's where I videotaped that big bear swimming. And I got cameras on the other side of this river. Three of them. I'll figure out how to get them. I'll get a dinghy down there, whatever. I got an inflatable. But it's just too loud to videotape down there. So I'll go back over to the other spot and we'll share some more and then I'm gonna get out of here. What I might do, as soon as I get caught up, is uh, I'm gonna drift this river in my inflatable, and I might uh, take the camera along with me and do the whole ride all the way down. I can go down this river, dumps in another river, and then goes around a big long bend down the road, and I can pull out right at my buddy's house. He's got riverfront property there. Now, what do we got? More voices to be heard. This is great, isn't it? I just love I love the fact that every single person is getting heard. I love it. It's just making those uh, wacko paths probably just seething. Like, can you imagine being one of those control freaks in the past? I can't believe this topic's being spoken about without me. I'm the one. I'm the authority. I'm the one that should be in front of the camera talking about this topic. Nobody else. All right, anyway, before I get going. What do we got? All right, what do we got? Here's a short one. Uh, what do we got? Hey, Steve, I'm the guy from Hudson's Hope that told you to come hunting with me. Me and my brother both found tracks up the Alaska Highway, and my youngest brother saw on by the train tracks, just saw one by the train tracks, just standing there one night, when he went through. I think I might have seen one moose hunting one time with my friend because no cow moose could blow and snort like that. My friend swear he saw two of them with his buddy down by the back eddies in the Peace River eating roots. And my dad's friend that was up the highway had a camp where something was ripping around and throwing sticks and rocks into their camp one night to summon one got a gun, shot it off to scare them. I found tracks in the same area 10 years later, 10 of them it went to the dugout and oh, 10 tracks went to the dugout and drank even had knuckle impressions in the mud three big ones from where it pushed off the ground with a closed fist get a hold of me i'll be around a bit phone number okay man i'm not up there right now but i will be thanks for that invite i'm coming back up in november i think there's tons of 
The Peace River is loaded with sightings. Loaded. We've had experiences there. It's non-stop. Bigfoot encounter. Here we go. What do we got? <clears throat> I live in Oregon. I'm an avid outdoor hiker, camper, and horseback trail rider. I've seen many unusual animal sightings, including an all-white buck, blue fox, and a white, white-tailed hawk. So my Bigfoot story took place around 20 miles east of Dexter Dam. I was working in Silver Lake, and I was driving back on a Saturday in late August. I had my Jack Russell with me, and we pulled over to take a break. We took a little trail, probably a fishing trail, that followed the river's edge. Up ahead, about 200 feet, there was a bend in the river, and in the middle of the river was what I first thought was a fisherman with his back to me. He appears to be bending over and was doing something in the water that I couldn't see. I thought maybe he had a fish. About that same time, my dog Pippin started growling like I've never heard her do before. I glanced down at her, taking my eyes off the fishing guy, and every hair on her was standing straight out as she was staring at the fisherman. I raised my eyes back from the fisherman, and now is facing me, staring at me and Pippin. I remember thinking, why is there a person in a monkey suit standing knee-deep in the middle of the river? We only stared at each other for a few seconds before it took a couple of big steps and moved out of the river onto the opposite bank and melted in the dense brush without a sound. During those few seconds, I tried to memorize everything about it. It wasn't built like bulky like an ape. Rather, it looked more a simian, more spider monkey-like. Really long arm bones. Much longer upper arm bone length than a human. Big hands with finger flanges that are much longer than humans. It had a chestnut colored coat that had a dense, shorter undercoat and long, lighter outer coat. The face had a low brow with a broad, flat nose and huge, round eyes. Its eyes were twice as big as humans. It had a narrow waist and appeared to be female. It looked youngish, which I'm kind of guessing, which I'm kind of guessing about, as it wasn't really developed in the breast. It had longish hair, more like human, and again, its upper leg bones, thigh bones, were proportionally longer than a human. It was difficult to say how tall it was since it was standing knee deep in the water, and I didn't walk out in the river. But river deepened on corners, and a guess would be at least three feet deep, making it at least six to seven feet my best guess. It never made any sound. It behaved just like any wild animal would, and I never felt threatened. But I also turned around and went back down the trail, back the way I'd come. It was broad daylight, about 10 a.m. in the morning on a bright sunny day. Some things that stood out to me are that it appeared to be quite capable and built for climbing. Its large round eyes spoke of a nocturnal animal and it must have been looking for food. It was really muscular. I could see easily see its muscles gripping when it moved. I really can't wrap my head around the fact that these animals are roaming around our wilderness. Sincerely, Robin. Yeah, it's pretty bizarre. They're probably thinking the same thing about us. Uh, the river thing. I, I mentioned that a few times. Uh, that's what happened to my grandfather. He skidded down his ass, hit that creek bed, and looked down. Here's this thing squatting over the river. Stood up, looked at him, took off, right? I don't know how many times I've heard people tell me they've seen one of these things on a river or a creek. It's always a river or a creek where they have a weakness, where they screw up. And I've said it before, I don't know what it is. Is it the water? Is it the land? The bench coming down? The noise? I don't know. But something screws up their sixth sense, their intuition, when they are along a creek or a river. So, um, it might be something for a lot of you people out there to keep in mind that if it's an encounter you do not wish to have and you're river fishing or hunting, uh, just realize that's where... A high percentage is going to happen. Somebody's here. I got to get going.